Morning. Today I wanted to talk about a different kind of um, building regression models. Um, and this is you know, multiple linear regression models for, for QTL analysis. But the, so the, you know, the a main part of my research work has been in analyzing experimental crosses where you have crossed um, inbred, a couple of inbred strains and measured a, a quantitative trait plus genome-wide genotypes in all of the offspring. And then you do a scan across the genome at each position, um, measure the association between the quantitative phenotype and um, genotype at that location. And so peaks in this in in this test statistic indicate that that's a location on chromosome four where the genotype there is associated with the quantitative outcome. And we have you know a double bumped peak on you know a two peaked curve on chromosome one, you know evidence that there's something going on in chromosome one that's where the genotype on chromosome one is associated with the quantitative outcome. We um, do a permutation test to to set this genome-wide threshold that um, controls the 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 family-wise error rate. So loci that reach this threshold, we think, are you know strong evidence for a QTL. Loci that are below this threshold are um, are you know the kinds of test statistics that you might get somewhere in the genome just by chance. So that, you know, this, the, we have here evidence for a locus on chromosome one and chromosome four. The sort of double bumped locus on chromosome one is interesting. Um, the next in line are six and 15, but we really just have these two loci. But this genome scan that I've shown you a bunch of times is um, considering each position one at a time and asking, is there an evidence for a QTL at this position? Is this particular location on chromosome 15 associated with the trait? Um, but it, there, there are lots of reasons why you might want to build a model that includes multiple locations. And that's, I mean, we see evidence for more than two or, you know, two at least positions that are influencing the trait we want to put them together and build a multiple QTL model. The, the, the example I'm talking about is one of my favorite examples. Um, it's pretty old, almost 20 years old now, but um, data on 250 male mice from a back cross between the A and the B strains, cross back to the B strain. Um, we have blood pressure measured two weeks after drinking high salt water or drinking with, you know, after drinking water that had salt. Um, so for each of the 250 mice, we have this measure of blood pressure. And we're interested in loci that are affecting that, that are contributing to that variation in blood pressure. And for each of the 250 mice, we have genotypes across the genome. Um, so say blue is homozygous and pink is heterozygous because this is a back cross. One of the reasons I like this particular example is that the, the complex missing data in the genotypes is punishing. So methods that are able to extract information from these data have to really confront um, kind of the the reality of genotype data in the you know in practice. So in this cross, um, the mice are sorted from lowest blood pressure to highest blood pressure, and for most of the genome, they just genotype the top 46 mice and the bottom 46 mice. The middle mice they didn't genotype at all until they had done an initial analysis and then they went in and added, you know, at positions in, you know, on chromosomes that are showing an effect on the, on the trait, they added in a bunch more um, positions where they genotyped everyone. 
and then they they further did have these you know these weird ladder um, effects in the genotypes. Basically, they they went into regions in between markers and added a bunch more markers, but just in mice that well, or largely in mice that had shown an exchange between the two outer markers. So these markers that it look like ladders, they genotype just recombinant individuals where the two surrounding markers, you know, mostly it's one was pink and one was blue, and they were trying to hone in on where that exchange from pink to blue occurred. Um, anyway, the goal is to use this data and, and associated with the phenotypes and um, to try to identify regions in the genome that we call quantitative trait loci that are affecting the affecting blood pressure and maybe to identify potential interactions among such loci. Sort of second, secondarily, we want to get at these intervals that contain the QTL. We know how well have we mapped the locus? and uh, learn about the estimated effects of the loci. But today I'm really going to focus on this, this first point of just trying to identify the QTL. And, you know, in particular, um, I'm interested, you know, I have this big effect locus on chromosome 4. If I take that into account, can it improve my ability to map the other, I mean, to identify the other loci across the genome? Um, this, you know, two bumps on chromosome one, are they really indicating that there are two QTL on chromosome one, or is it just, a, is this just sort of a chance double bumped thing? It's worthwhile. So, I mean, the, the major loci that I'm seeing, chromosome one, chromosome four, um, Here's just to show that kind of the effects of those QTL that um, going from the homozygous B genotype to the heterozygous genotype, you get a drop in blood pressure of about four units here, about um, six or seven units here. The chromosome six and 15 loci that are not showing significant effects, you know, their, um, their effects you know, the estimated effects are about half as big, you know, maybe, you know, three units of blood pressure um, each. Um, and another thing that's interesting is that the chromosome six locus has an effect that's in the opposite direction of the other ones. It turns out that the, the A strain has low blood pressure relative to the B strain, and the chromosome one, four, and 15 QTL all show effects in that direction. The chromosome six locus is what has been called a transgressive QTL, meaning that the, the, the strain with the low trait includes an allele that seems to be increasing the phenotype. But that's, um, but, you know, keep in mind that both 6 and 15, the effects are, are much smaller than you could really say are real, given the, 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 um, given the, the scan across the genome that we did. Well, you know, why go after multiple QTL? Um, so one reason is that um, if you have a locus of big effect, you take it into account, you are reducing the residual variation when you're looking for further QTL. So this, um, you know, one reason to, to build models that include multiple loci is that um, you consider by conditioning on on the major loci, you can increase your power to to identify loci of more modest effect. And the second reason is to try to separate these potentially linked QTL, like that double humped peak on chromosome one. Um, you might ask, you know, is that two QTL or one? And really, the only good way to figure that out is to um, fit, a fit a model that includes both loci and compare it to the best single locus model and ask how much does the quality of fit improve if you add a second locus into the model. So the, and the, the 
third point is to try to identify interactions among QTL, which geneticists add yet another term for this. They call this epistasis. Um, origin of that term isn't important, but I, um, it's been, ep epistasis is basically the same thing as, as interactions among covariates in, um, you know, in statistics generally. You know, a back cross like the one that we're we're thinking about. Um, this is to illustrate the 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 case of interactions between two loci. So the the dots here are the average phenotype for various two locus genotypes. So the two the um, this is the average phenotype for mice that are homozygous A at both QTL1 and at QTL2. And this is the average phenotype for mice that are heterozygous at QTL1, but homozygous A at QTL2, say. So this difference from here to here is the effect of QTL1 if you're homozygous A at QTL2. Whereas this is, you know, the average phenotype if you're homozygous A at QTL1, but heterozygous at QTL2, and the average trait if you're heterozygous at both loci. So this difference here to here is the effect of QTL1 when you're heterozygous at QTL2. So that the effect of QTL1 is the same no matter which genotype you have at QTL2 says that these two loci are additive. Whereas in the figure on the right, the effect of QTL1 when you're homozygous A at QTL2 smaller than the effect of QTL1 when you're heterozygous at QTL2. So this is saying these two QTL interact, or geneticists would say they're epistatic. They're showing epistasis. Sometimes people will say that these two QTL act independently. I don't really like that term very much. I would prefer to stick to additive or interact. Um, uh, but Basically, the idea is two QTL interact that in, it's exactly the same as interactions in, in statistical models generally, the interactions between covariates of if they're, the effect of one locus is the same, no matter the category you're at, at, the other QTL, the other covariate, then they're additive. If the effect of one locus is different depending on what category you're in for the other locus they're said to interact. Um, in, an, in an intercross, you have three genotypes at each QTL. And so here we have um, two additive QTL because the, the pattern of effect at QTL1, this sort of curve, this is the pattern of effect of QTL1 for different genotypes at QTL2, that those three curves are all parallel, says that the two loci are additive. Whereas over here, the pattern of effect of QTL1 is very different depending on the genotype at QTL2, that sort of when QTL2 is homozygous B, then you have you know, one pattern of effect, and when QTL2 is homozygous A, you have the other pattern of effect. So these two QTL are said to interact. Anytime that the three curves are, are not parallel, we say there's an interaction. You, you know, it's, if, I, if I transform the phenotype in some way, like took logs or square roots, um, it would destroy this parallel um, the, the parallel nature of these curves. They would no longer be parallel. So whether things interact or not is dependent on the scale at which you're measuring. Except, you know, here, um, no transformation is going to get these back parallel again. So sometimes, well, some people really view this kind of interaction, you know, that can't be restored by transformation as fundamentally different from the kind of interaction on the pe previous slide, where here I could find a transformation that would make these parallel again. It's kind of a different nature of interaction. 
but the key thing with interactions is what you know is, is just like interactions between other covariates with um with this example data um if i look at the the picture for the chromosome one and chromosome four loci um looking i think at the the right hump in the chromosome one the the two loci look to be you know as close to perfectly added as, as you can get that um the the effect of chromosome four is pretty much the same whether you're homozygous b or heterozygous at, at chromosome one um for the six and 15 loci however the 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 chromosome 15 locus has basically no effect if you're homozygous b at chromosome six and the chromosome 15 locus has a big effect if you're heterozygous at chromosome six and sort of the opposite the other way that um, the difference between these two points is basically zero. The difference between these two points is large. So chromosome six has a big effect if you're homozygous B at chromosome 15, but basically no effect if you're heterozygous at chromosome 15. Um, and that the effect here from 100 to you know 107 is you know pretty close to as big as the effect of the chromosome four locus. So if you take this this potential interaction into account, six and fifteen start to look really like a big deal. They really they have a big effect on blood pressure, but only when you consider consider them jointly. If you ignore the potential interaction, this you know seven unit effect on blood pressure gets dampened by a half, and so they neither of them looks all that interesting on their own. And that, um, so in, you know, trying to identify the, you know, loci that are affecting um, quantitative phenotypes, I'm interested in taking account of interactions mostly so that I can see this sort of thing, that um, the presence of an interaction doesn't get in the way of me identifying critical loci that are affecting the trait. It, you know, here, taking into account of interaction, the, the influence of these loci on the trait are obvious. Ignoring interactions, they both look un, pretty uninteresting. There are loads of different approaches for doing model selection in this sort of regression context, or, you know, like in homework four that you'll see, um, trying to, you know, there are a variety of different methods for um, building models for prediction that may include omitting some, some variables. So, um, you know, subset selection of sort of identifying some subset of variables that you're, some fixed subset of variables that you're interested in, or this kind of L1 penalized regression called the, the lasso. Um, where you put a penalty on the the sum of the absolute values of effects, and that leads some of the some some covariates to get thresholded to zero. Um, you know, forest regression or Bayes methods. There are lots of different approaches to doing model selection um, with quantitative outcomes. Much of this work is really focused on trying to predict the outcome, building a model for prediction, which in a lot of contexts is really important. In this particular context of trying to identify QTL, prediction, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, one might be interested in, in using genetic information to try to predict an outcome like blood pressure um, in humans. But we're not really interested in predicting blood pressure in mice, I think. Um, well, I can be confident that we're not interested in, in blood pressure prediction in mice. In 
the the experiments I'm talking about, they're really aimed at trying to identify the key loci, and we don't care that much about prediction. I'm going to focus mostly on subset selection. Um, I'm, what I like about it is building quite um, parsimonious models. Um, and as, as you'll see, I really feel like the kind of the key thing for many of these um, QTL mapping experiments is try to identify a set of loci that are having a strong effect on the outcome. And we're most in not including um, extraneous terms that don't matter. I, I like to think of this model selection or variable selection, uh, you know, particularly the, the sub -select, subset selection problem is being this split up into four parts. First, there's the the class of models that you're considering, whether you're going to consider strictly additive QTL models, not allowing the QTL to interact, whether you're going to allow pairwise interactions among QTL, whether you're going to potentially include higher order interactions like three-way or four-way interactions among loci. And or another class of models would be regression trees, which is um, sort of making a decision tree where the outcomes are some prediction of the, the, the phenotype. The, this is a class of models that, that sort of goes after interactions among loci immediately rather than as sort of a, a secondary thing when you're thinking about um, linear models with pairwise interactions. This class of models is a... Um, kind of a key first consideration that I think depends partly on you know, um, the size of the data set that you have. Um, it, you know, if you have not very much data, it might be better to just stick with additive models because you don't have much ability to find pairwise interactions, even if they exist. And so um, better to just reduce the, the, the scope of the search um, and ignore pairwise interactions. Um, so the second consideration is part of the, the problem is how to fit models. Here I'm really just thinking about the, the missing data problem, um, that I, I'm missing genotypes at a lot of loci, and I have these gaps between markers that I might want to impute. Um, if I had you know, complete genotype data at the markers, dense markers, I would just do linear regression, and this wouldn't be a consideration, but um, sort of in the QTL mapping context, this is, you know, another, you know, there are a bunch of different ways of trying to deal with missing data in the covariates. Um, the, the, really, the, the two biggest pieces are how to compare models and how to search through the space of models. So for model comparison, really the question is, um, you know, as you add terms to the model, you get a, a improved fit to the data. And the question is how many, I mean, how much of an improved fit should, um, should you require for you to be willing to add another term? The, main approaches for comparing models at different size are to get some um, some kind of estimated prediction error, like looking at the residual sum of squares and adjusting it for the size of the model in some way, or um, something that's like a penalized likelihood where you're, you're taking the quality of fit of the model and, and subtracting off a penalty for the, the size of the model. AIC and BIC both behave sort of like that. Or you can do a full Bayesian analysis where you put a prior on models and then your, your goal is to try to maximize some posterior. In my view, this is really the most important consideration when it comes to, to variable selection is how are you going to compare models, particularly models of different sizes. 
So I'll spend more time talking about this. Um, the, the, the last point is how to search the space of models. So even if you're even if you're considering strictly additive QTL models, you will quickly find yourself in a position where there are far more models that you could, there are far more models than you can consider exhaustively. So you can't fit all possible models. When you when you start when you include interactions, this gets, you know, this this space of models increases um, astronomically. But even with strictly additive models, there will be more models than you can really consider exhaustively. Variety of different ways of searching the space of models to try to get at the 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 optimal ones. Um, forward selection is um, you start by considering the, the covariates one at a time and you pick the what gives the the best you know single term model and then you hold that constant and search for a second covariate to add and then you you build up create a nested sequence of of models of increasing size the, um, this is viewed quite negatively in statistics be because um, once you pick, once you put a term into the model, you're, you're stuck with it and there's no way to get rid of it. Um, it backward elimination, sort of the opposite where you start with a big model and you remove, you omit one term at a time and go, um, create a, a nested sequence of models of decreasing size. So at each stage you, you say among the, the terms in my model, which which, when I drop it, has the least effect. Uh, um, and you you drop that one. This turns this generally better than forward selection. Um, and stepwise selection, sort of going back and forth, grad, you know, adding terms, subtracting terms in some um, deterministic way. And then there are a variety of different randomized algorithms for searching the space of models, including you know, simulated annealing or markup chain Monte Carlo. Um, the, my view that these models search, well, the, the key thing is to choose a, um, a method for comparing models. And then model search is all about um, trying to optimize that model comparison criterion. And you do what you can to optimize that criterion as the goal. Um, you know, when what whereas mostly in Q, mostly in this sort of variable selection problem, we're focused on um, minimizing prediction error, giving a, a model that finding a model that predicts well. Here, I think our goal is really to identify the the key terms. And selecting a model includes two kinds of errors that you can be missing important terms and you can be including extraneous terms. Whereas in hypothesis testing, you do one or the other. Here, we're making both errors at the same time. By choosing a set of, a set of variables, we are missing some important ones and potentially including some extraneous ones. And what I view as the goal here is, um, th is that we try to identify as many correct terms as possible and um, but controlling the rate of inclusion of extraneous terms. So this is, you know, sort of a hypothesis testing kind of view of the variable selection problem. But kind of for this specific map and QTL that are affecting a trait like blood pressure, I think this is what my collaborators are interested in: is try to find as many QTLs as they can. But the ones that they, the ones that identify have a, have a very small rate, of, you know, very small chance of being false positives, and that's because really the the next stage of trying to prove whether those loci have an effect, trying to identify the underlying gene, are really onerous activities, and you don't want to be devoting time to trying to find map a locus that doesn't actually have an effect. This is not a universal view 
that I have here though, um, this is just my own view of what I think the goal of this of this problem is. And so there's this huge, vast literature on variable selection and regression, but most of it, I think, has little is is not all that useful to us for this particular problem, in that there are a lot of ways in which this problem, QTL mapping, is very different from the usual kind of variable selection problem. That, um, you know, first that our goal is not prediction, but to identify the major players. It, you know, it may be that um, building a model that predicts well will give you um, the major players, but it tends to be that um, a model focused on prediction is more um, it, um, forgiving of inclusion of, sort of junk terms, that including something that doesn't, doesn't matter is, um, won't hurt your prediction as much as leaving off something that can really help. What's really unusual in our QTL mapping problem is that we have is that the nature of the covariates that we're considering these genetic loci that you know compared to say building a prediction model in finance or in epidemiology, we have this you know set of ordinal valued covariates, the the markers and their genotypes. And we have kind of a continuum of them that you know, we have data at discrete loci, but we're really interested in the continuum of positions between them. Um, we don't have to get the exact right covariate, but we need to get, you know, in the region of the right covariate in a way. So that, I mean, kind of rather different than when your covariates are things like, um, BMI and um, smoking history. Um, and secondly, that the association among covariates is really different here than in other contexts. That you know, genetic loci on different chromosomes are effectively independent. You know, the genotype data is it has these blocks of you know chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, and from chromosome to chromosome, the covariates are completely independent. But then even along a chromosome, there's this very quite simple and known correlation structure that is inherited from this pattern of recombination of events that occur at meiosis. So, you know, along a chromosome, the covariates are changing, you know, in an individual are changing, say, from homozygous to heterozygous back to homozygous again, because of these co these these recombination events that happen. The correlation structure is um, the co covariates are highly correlated, but they're correlated in a very simple way, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, if you think of you know, education and income and age and cholesterol and blood pressure, the kind of covariates that you would think about in healthcare um, that, ha you know, it's a complicated mess. Here, things are kind of simple. Because of that, some, you know, approaches to variable selection that work really badly in lots of other cases end up working kind of kind of well in this particular context. And that includes um, this forward selection approach. So simple ways of, of searching the space of models can behave quite well when you have this rather you know simple correlation structure among the covariates that wouldn't behave well at all in um, you know, a, a general prediction problem. Well, I guess um, first I wanted to say a couple words about kind of exploratory methods of, um, you know, you have data, you've done a scan across the genome to look for QTL. In this particular case, we found a QTL in chromosome one and four. Um, 
you you know there are a variety of things you can do to try to um, explore multiple um, covariate models without you know some full system that you could for example you know condition on a single large effect QTL we could you know condition on the chromosome 4 QTL and scan do sort of like one step of forward selection take scan for a second QTL compare models that have both QTL1 and QTL2 in them and compare it to a model that has just QTL1 in it and look at that across the genome kind of a conditional log score so this by conditioning on the chromosome four locus you can reduce the the residual variation and maybe increase your power to detect further QTL um, secondly you could do a two-dimensional scan of the genome sort of the analogous I mean sort of the first thing you might do beyond scanning the genome once is to look look at all two QTL models look at all pairs of positions across the genome to see whether you know is there evidence for a pair of loci in chromosome one or is there evidence for any interaction among loci and then further you could just piece together all the like hints of effects on chromosomes 1, 4, 6, and 15 and ask, you know, if shove them all together into one model, do any of them seem to interact? Um, if you drop them one at a time, how much, you know, do they, you know, having put them all together, does it mean that some of them should be omitted? Um, but for, for my example data, this is the, um, this is a, a scan controlling for the chromosome 4 locus. So the, the kind of purplish color, the bluish color, is the, the initial QTL mapping results, um, where I'm just doing single QTL models. And then in pink, I'm doing a scan where I'm conditioning on the locus on chromosome 4. So at each of these positions on chromosome 1, in the pink curve, I'm comparing a model with a locus on one and this locus on four and comparing that to um, just the model with the locus on four. So conditioning on chromosome four, the evidence for a locus on chromosome one increases dramatically. Um, and there's, you still have this double humped curve, but there's some stronger evidence for the second hump than for the first hump. But the rest of the genome hardly has changed at all. Um, you know, the, the effect of the chromosome 15 locus or the evidence for a locus on chromosome 15 doesn't change at all, having accounted for chromosome 4. On chromosome 6, um, you know, this a, a second hump shows up at the tip of the chromosome if I account for chromosome 4. But overall, the evidence for there being a locus on chromosome 6 isn't really changed by... Um, controlling for chromosome four. Um, this is sort of a common experience for me that even even when I have loci of really big effect, the locus here has a really big effect on blood pressure. Um, accounting for it often doesn't really matter that much, just because my phenotypes in the my you know health related phenotypes in mice tend to have a lot of individual variation accounting for and the the individual loci even though they you know can be strong they're not really that strong um, in comparison to just the environmental variation um, This is the the other major exploratory tool that I use is, you know, I, you know, piece together one, four, six, and 15. I look at whether six, whether any of these pair interact and I see a strong interaction between six and 15, put it, shove them all together into one model and then drop one term at a time. If I take this four QTL model and I drop the locus on chromosome one, how much does the log 10 likelihood change? If I drop chromosome four, how much does the log 10 likelihood change? And I can see that I have, you know, very strong evidence for the loci on one and four. 
um, if I take this four QTL model plus the interaction, and I drop the interaction term, how much does the log likelihood change? Um, and then here, if I drop, say, the locus on chromosome six that's involved in the interaction, then I'm going to drop the interaction as well. So um, that ends up being a two degree of freedom test. So I, I never, if I include an interaction term, I always include both marginal effects as well, or main effects as well. So, I mean, exploratory tools go a long way towards trying to figure out, you know, the set of loci underneath that are contributing to a trait. And if, if I had the time, I might go and sort of by hand analyze um, each trait um, in that kind of organic um, manual way. There are a variety of reasons to try to go after an automated approach for this sort of analysis that you... Um, could build a, build a method that would bring some assistance to non-specialists in the area so that they could, you know, shove their data through some automated model building approach and get reasonable results, you know, without um, knowing that much about what they're doing. Secondly, you know, an automated method is really kind of required if you want to really, if you want to do any sort of, um, study to understand its performance, like computer simulations. If you want to, I mean, computer simulations to try to learn about how different methods are performing, you really only conducive to fully automated um, model building um, algorithms. And finally, you know, we're getting to the point where, where these sorts of studies have not just, you know, one or a few rates, but they tend to have you know, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of phenotypes that they've measured, especially when we're looking at um, sort of high throughput, you know, genome scale kind of phenotypes like gene expression or, or protein proteomics type data. And if we want to apply these sort of multiple QTL approaches to that, we need a fully automated and ideally quite fast method. So um, my approach is if we, if we consider just the strictly additive QTL model approach or situation, imagine that there's no, there are no interactions among loci. And imagine we have quite dense, complete genotype data, so I can ignore the whole um, missing data aspect. I'm left with, I have this linear model where um, individual QTL are contributing to the trait, and I want to know, you know, which of these QTL actually matter, which of them have non-zero coefficients. And I'm going to focus on um, kind of a penalized log score approach, maybe similar to AIC or BIC. And I have some measure of quality of fit of a model, a model denoted here gamma for a model. Is it really a set of variables set of QTL. The log score for the model gamma is the log 10 likelihood ratio comparing that model to the null model of the model with no QTL. So this is measuring the quality of fit of a model. As I add additional terms, this thing will always increase. But I'm going to penalize it by some penalty times the size of the model. Here the um, absolute value of gamma is the number of QTL in that model. So as I add terms, this will increase. And so I'm looking for um, what model maximizes this penalized lot score. And what I want is, I, well, what I need to do is choose this penalty. What I want is to choose the penalty so that um, the chance the, the model with maximized penalized log score will have a low rate of inclusion of extraneous terms. In, in thinking about that penalty, you know, what penalty should I use? 
um, I it seemed worthwhile to think about, well, imagine the null hypothesis were true. Imagine that there were no QTL anywhere. This penalized log score for the null model with no QTL is this log score is the log score for the null model compared to itself is this thing is zero. The null model has no QTL in it, so that part's zero. So for the for the null model, this penalized log score is strictly zero. And I want compare that to models with a single QTL at some position lambda. So the penalized log score for the model where I have a single QTL at position lambda is you know the the value of the log curves at lambda in the genome minus this penalty t because the size of the model is strictly one. So this you know imagine the null hypothesis is true. Um, this I would and I did a scan across the genome and looked at every position lambda one at a time and calculated the log lambda calculated this penalized log score. Um, I would falsely choose, you know, a, a QTL model at position lambda when this log lambda minus t is bigger than zero. So when log lambda is bigger than t. So if I choose this penalty so that um, the chance of this log score being bigger than t is kept low if there's no QTL, it would do the, what I want. So this suggests choosing as this penalty my um, permutation-based genome scan threshold. If I choose the T to be that like 5% threshold in the permutation test, then when the null hypothesis is true, this thing will exceed that at my chosen rate 5%. And so I'll have a procedure that if the null hypothesis is true, the chance of, and I do a single QTL scan, the chance of falsely concluding that there's a QTL, QTL somewhere is maintained at um, my target rate. And then I just cross my fingers and hope that um, when I increase the, the search to larger models, when the truth is maybe has a case of there being multiple QTL, hope that it has the same kind of behavior. But so my point is, in this where I'm thinking about strictly additive QTL, I'm going to use as an approach a penalized log score where I take the quality of fit of a model and subtract off some penalty um, where the on each QTL I add to the model. And that what's left is to decide what penalty to use. And if I think about this case of imagine the null hypothesis is true and I do a scan over single QTL models, that suggests using as the penalty this um, significance threshold, you know, accounting for the genome scan. So I'm going to use that, but use it for models of larger size. In the in a mouse cross that gives our penalty is about 2.7 in a back cross and 3.5 in an inner cross. And um, in a, a paper, you know, that now seems like prehistory, but it's history for me. Um, did extensive simulations to show that this approach worked reasonably well, that it controlled the rate of inclusion of extraneous terms um, at the target rate quite well. Doing strict forward selection tends to overselect. So if I do forward selection, uh, um, I'll tend to produce a model that has um, a high, you know, the, the correct terms, but also will include an extraneous term at a higher rate than I want. But if I do forward selection followed by backward elimination, you know, I build a model, build a large model, and then do backward elimination after that, that works as well as the fanciest sort of randomized algorithm I can construct. Um, 
so, you know, the other pieces of this, our experience with this is the, the need to have established performance criteria of what is it that you're trying to do in this sort of approach. And you really need large scale simulations to, to show um, how different methods work. To handle interaction terms, um, I, I'm interested in, in considering pairwise interactions among QTL, mostly so that I don't miss things that matter, like in that um, blood pressure data set, the, the chromosome 6 and 15 terms that only really look interesting if you consider their interaction. Um, if I want to include interaction terms, I need to expand this penalized log score. So I take, you know, the, the quality of fit of the model as this log 10 likelihood, and I penalize it by the number of main effects in the model, and I maybe subtract off another penalty for the number of interaction terms in the model. I could, I could stick with the main effect penalty as what I chose previously is from this genome scan permutation threshold, but I'm left with how do I choose this interaction penalty? The, the first idea I had was, well, cho choose it in sort of a similar way of imagine that there are two additive QTL and do a 2D scan to look for interactions and then compare the best two locus interactive model to the best two locus additive model and take the 95th percentile of that difference. Um, if, if I put that as my penalty on interaction terms, it will have the same kind of performance that it will control the rate of inclusion of extraneous interactions. But the, the penalty tends to be quite high that um, this sort of penalty on interactions in a back cross is about the same as for the main effect penalty, but in an inner cross it has, um, you know, it's a it's a it's a pretty big threshold to try to 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 exceed if you want to find interactions. I had this other idea of. Um, You know, if, if the first idea seemed good, I could do another. My other idea is do a 2D scan and compare the best two locus interactive model to the best single locus model. So going from a single locus model to a two locus interaction model is sort of adding to the model both a second locus and an interaction term. And I'll take that and define my interaction penalty to be this, this, thing minus whatever my main effect penalty is. Um, I screwed up my slide here a little bit um, so that it doesn't actually show. If th this procedure, it has the advantage that the, the penalty on interactions is much lighter. It, in principle, will lead to uh, it, it will have a, a high rate of inclusion of extraneous interactions, but it does a better job of identifying loci that interact. Can be useful in this sort of context to think of models as graphs. Um, if I stick with this hierarchy where I include interaction terms only when I've included the main effect terms for each QTL, then I can define QTL models as graphs of, you know, individual dots in a model are the QTL and lines connecting them say, I'm, I'm inclu including the interaction term as well. Um, but it, so if I apply this approach to my hypertension data, um, kind of the, the main model that, I'm in, that I was interested in is this, a QTL on chromosome 1, a QTL on chromosome 4, a QTL on 6 and 15, and with the 6 and 15 loci interacting. Um, the overall log 10 likelihood compared to the null model is 23. Um, if I 
if I drop this chromosome one locus, the LOD score goes down by 6.3. So I would for sure, and the, the main effect penalty here is 2.7. So chromosome one is for sure would stay in the model. And similarly, if I drop chromosome four or I drop six or seven, or I drop the interaction term, the, the log likelihood goes down much more than my penalties. And so I would um, keep all of this stuff in my model by this penalty system that I've just vaguely described to you. Um, it, I, it, I find it useful to, to plot these profile odd curves for a multiple QTL model like this. So that the pink curves are the, the, the single QTL scan, just the, the base scan. The purple curves are um, the, the purple curves are derived by taking this four, this four QTL model plus the interaction between six and 15. And keep for each for each chromosome, I keep the other three QTL fixed at their best locations. And I scan across the chromosome for the location of this QTL. And I compare this four locus QTL model to the, the model where I've dropped chromosome one. So the height of this curve tells me evidence for to keep the chromosome one locus in the model. And the relative heights of the curve tells me about how precisely I've localized chromosome one. So in um, you know the the so the, the pink curve is just comparing a model with a chromosome six locus to a model without any QTL. The blue curve is comparing a model with the chroma with all four of these loci and the two QTL interaction to a model where I drop chromosome six and drop the interaction. Um, so it it can be an, an it's an effective way to show both the evidence for these loci and about how precisely I've mapped them. Um, I, I showed this thing before, um, so I'll skip it here. But so the, the second thing I might do is look to, can I add an interaction term? If I, I take this sort of base model of one, four, six, and 15 and their interaction, if I add an interaction between one and four, um, the LOD score increases by 0.6, which is way lower than what my interaction penalty is. So I would not add that interaction. And if I go through the interactions one at a time, usually none of them look interesting at all. And so I would not add an interaction to this model. I can also scan the genome for an additional locus. If I scan on chromosome one and try to add a second QTL on that chromosome, that this is sort of evidence to add a second QTL on chromosome one doesn't reach what my main effect penalty is. And so I would not add a second QTL on chromosome one. It's interesting, but not, doesn't, um, not strong evidence. Um, chromosomes two and five are sort of next in line for being interesting, but neither of them are, I mean, are quite up to what my penalties are. So my penalized lot score would go down if I added any of those loci to the model. I can look for adding an interactive locus. Next in line is this a, a locus on chromosome 7 interacting with chromosome 15, but it's, it would need to hit both sort of the main, main effect and interaction penalty. It doesn't, isn't even close. Um, so also evidence for like a second QTL on chromosome four interacting with the locus on chromosome six, but it again doesn't um, meet what I would need to add it. I think the most the most interesting possibility is uh, there's a pair of tightly linked loci on chromosome three, that if I jointly add them to the model, the the LOD score increases by four point six, but it would need to hit 
5.4 before I would add those two to the model. So it's not, I mean, so I would leave those off too. So basically all this work to say my multiple QTL model comparison method um, leaves me with just this locus on chromosome 1, locus on chromosome 4, 6 and 15, and then interaction term. Um, it doesn't give me anything new besides that. But on the other hand, you can say that I have now a fully automated method that um, leads you to this, this simple model um, without really any um, extra, I mean, just in a fully automated way. So I, I skipped over some kind of critical details, but um, my, my point here was really to, to emphasize that this QTL mapping problem is really a, a model selection or variable selection problem in regression. But it's somewhat different than many of the other um, variable selection problems that arise, including um, you know, those in you know, finance and epidemiology where you know, we're not here interested in prediction. We're interested in identifying the key loci. Um, in this problem, I, I view that this, how to choose the criterion for comparing models is the most important thing. And that defining the target, which for me is find as many of the major players as you can, controlling the rate of inclusion of extraneous terms as kind of the critical one. I'm using this penalized likelihood method where the penalties are derived from permutation tests. Um, it, it's quite conservative, but um, but it, I think it, it meets the needs of this QTL mapping problem reasonably well. There's a, a, if you want to read more about that, um, there's a, a paper in genetics more than 10 years ago. Um, But I'll, I'll leave it at that for the day. I will um, turn off the recording.